Big decisions require research. So if your teenager is considering a decision as big as joining the military, they're doing their homework. You can too, by visiting todaysmilitary.com because their success tomorrow begins with your support today. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello once again and thank you so much for joining us on yet another episode of the Space Nuts podcast. They just seem to meld into one another, so we'll just call this episode Infinity <laughs> or it could be episode 221. My name's Andrew Dunkley, your host, and with me as always is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hi, Andrew. 221. Who could believe it? I could wrap I didn't, it up. Uh, <laughs> I didn't ever anticipate we'd get this far. I thought we'd do two or three episodes and people would go, oh, it's rubbish, and that would be the end of it. <laughs> well, they still do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, still yes they do. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Now, oh, no, we'll just, do it. we'll just be an audience of two if it comes down to that. I mean, That's the right. first couple of years were like that. Yeah. Now, uh, today we're going to talk about the Rosetta spacecraft. It's back in the news because it's detected uh, something uh, emitting... Uh, or uh, happening with a comet, which you would not expect. I, I, I would not think that you would see this when it comes to a comet, but that, that's exactly what it is, and I haven't explained it because that's your job. Uh, we'll also talk about Russia's claim to Venus. Yes, they own it, apparently. They what, it, Can we arrange for them to move there, perhaps? Um, and, and they're welcome to it maybe. Uh, and NASA's plans to go back to the moon in 2024. They're talking about putting uh, the first woman on the moon, which I think is fantastic. And we'll answer questions about fuzzy telescope images. Uh, was the universe a black hole when it started? And a bit of confusion about uh, an image on a TV show that somebody uh, has asked about. We'll, um, we'll tackle all of those things today on the Space Nuts podcast. But first, Fred, the Rosetta spacecraft, um, auroral emissions is what it says in the headline. That uh, sounds rather fascinating and in an unusual place. It's extraordinary. That's right. Um, so this is a, a reanalysis or, or a further analysis, if I can put it that way, uh, by uh, scientists at the Southwestern Research Institute, which is in Colorado, if I remember rightly, uh, who, who are, you know, the world experts on planetary science uh, of this kind. I think it's where Alan Stern was based uh, when he became the New Horizons project manager. Um, so scientists there have been looking at data from some of the equipment that was flown on board the Rosetta spacecraft, which you and I talked about uh, interminably a few years ago because that spacecraft was in orbit around Comet 67P, otherwise known as Churyum of Gerasimenko. Uh, gosh, I can still say it. That's amazing. Yeah, um, which, it was, <laughs> which was in orbit around Rosetta. If I remember rightly, yes, it was 2014 uh, through to 2016. So a long period of time, it was when you and I used to talk on the radio that we talked so much about Rosetta. Uh, and that uh, has, uh, that, so that the new analysis has turned up something completely unexpected, which is that uh, the comet 67P has a Rory. <laughs> Work that one no. out. Um, I, uh, I can't. No, no, they can't. They have done, though, which is good. Uh, so it, it's um, uh, on the Earth, of course, which is rather bigger than the comet. The comet, if I remember rightly from those days, it's about four kilometres across, I think. Uh, it's a it's a shape like a rubber duck. That was the uh, the joke when, when the spacecraft was approaching it because all we could see was this rubber duck in space. Uh, very common... Um, morphology, uh, it's actually two chunks stuck together and the gravi gravimetric measurements demonstrated that that were made by, uh, by Rosetta. Uh, so uh, the comet, much smaller than the Earth, the Earth has a magnetic field, the comet doesn't. And we are all familiar with the idea that the magnetic field lines at the Earth's magnetic poles are where the uh, uh, subatomic particles from the sun are, elect, uh, are accelerated, uh, they spiral down the field lines and interact with the atoms of the Earth's atmosphere. 
and cause uh, essentially cause this uh, the, the beautiful phenomenon known as the aurora. Don't get me started on the aurora because I can wax. Oh, no, that's so spectacular. <laughs> yeah, for months and months, uh, they are fantastic. Um, but how do you get the same thing happening on a comet? And so uh, what they've, what in fact, it was that the, the emission, the light itself that was detected at first um, that sent them up the wrong path. So one of the scientists whose name is uh, Joel Parker um, uh, of Sweary said initially we thought the ultraviolet emissions at Comet 67P were phenomena known as day glow, uh, a process caused by solar photons, that's the particles of light from the sun, interacting with the gas of the comet. And we, we should just clarify that the comet itself has... Uh, you know, the comet is a, is, a, is basically a flying iceberg, uh, but around it is what's called the coma, which is the envelope of gas that has been released from the comet's surface uh, as as it uh, as it gets nearer the sun. So what they were thinking was that uh, initially they thought that it was the photons of light interacting with the co the gas of the coma that formed this day glow, the ultraviolet uh, emissions that they could see, but. Um, th using uh, more than one instrument, uh, one of them is called ALICE, which was the uh, spectrograph that was used, the ultraviolet spectrograph. Uh, but there's another instrument called the Ion and Electron Sensor, IES, uh, which was also used, and it was that that t turned up the smoking gun, that actually these emissions are not day glow uh, because they're not caused by particles of light from the sun, but they're caused by electrons from the sun, which is the solar wind itself. So he went on to say, or Joel Parker went on to say, we were amazed to discover that ultraviolet emissions are aurorae, driven not by photons, but by electrons in the solar wind that break apart water and other molecules in the comet and have been accelerated in the comet's nearby environment. The resulting excited atoms make this distinctive light. Um, so uh, it's not clear to me how they are accelerated. I think what happens is that the electrons from the sun, um, which are you know piling along, we're feeling them all the time here in the Earth's environment, um, they hit the... Uh, the water, let's just take water because that's the most common molecule that's that's emitted by the comet because it's mostly ice. Um, they, uh, those, uh, the electrons hit the water molecules. Um, the, the electrons, I should make it clear, are in the solar wind. They hit the water molecules, which are in the comet's uh, corona, and break them down into hydrogen and oxygen. And it's the... The, the the basically the fact that you suddenly have uh individual atoms of of uh, hydrogen and oxygen that actually uh, cause the aurora to glow um there's some sort of excitation process which i haven't really uh studied in enough detail to comment on but it it basically was a surprise uh that it wasn't just what they call day glow just a a, a fairly um mundane form of excitation of light uh, from the comet, but actually this process that involves uh, atoms being, or molecules being knocked apart uh, that causes the auroral glow. So a remarkable discovery. Um, yes, indeed. You... So if you, were, if you were flying alongside the comet while this was happening, would you, would, it, would you see it like you see it standing on Earth? Would it be that obvious? Um, no, uh, it wouldn't. Uh, partly because it's in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum, so you don't, you wouldn't see. Uh, it's not invisible light. Um, it's, so that that's so. Yeah, just reading a little bit more about the uh, uh, about the process. Um, the uh, bottom line here is that when the uh, the molecules of water you know, the, the molecules of water that come from the comet, when they're broken up by these electrons, when they're broken apart to hydrogen and oxygen, those atoms are themselves in an excited state. That's the, the crucial bit that I was missing before. Those atoms themselves are excited and they de-excite uh, by 
releasing ultraviolet light. So what you've got is the impact of an electron that is converted to the ultraviolet light, and that process is what causes an aurora. There you go. We got there in the end, Andrew. Oh, <laughs> but, wow. Just, yeah. no, but the last thing you'd expect a comet to yes, that's be right. doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just, okay. Just a, a loose end that, of course, Rosetta was, I don't think I mentioned this, a mission of the European Space Agency, one of their really successful flagship missions, which is why we're still talking about it four years after it, uh, you know, after the after the spacecraft. I think it actually wound up landing on the comet, didn't it? That was what happened at the end. I, I believe so, yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, um, no, that's a, it's a fantastic mission and uh, it's good that they're still gathering data because, uh, you know, that's what you, that's what you want from a mission, a bit of longevity and a bit of extra information, things that you don't expect. Uh, always, always very exciting. Uh, and and uh, let's just move straight on to the, uh, the next topic, which has certainly hit the news this week. And, of course, uh, the tabloid press, as always, have, have uh, nailed this one down pretty quickly. Uh, I, I did actually search through the list of stories associated with this to find a credible source, which I sent to you. But uh, Russia has laid claim to Venus. Yeah, uh, well, that's right. Yes. Um, so what we're talking about here is, you know, we've talked about the phosphine on um, in the atmosphere of Venus. If I remember rightly, we might have talked about that last week. Um, Indeed. I spent last, all last week talking about that. So I'm sure you and I did as well. Um, so the, the day after that announcement was made, the president of Roscosmos, the Russian Space Agency, um, which is actually, I have to say, you know, it's a top-notch organisation. It's not a fly-by-night organisation at all. They are big players in the International Space Station, so it's it's very much um, you know one of the one of the global players in uh, space activities. But their president, uh, Dmitry Rogotsin, I think is the way his name is pronounced, um, said something to the effect that Russia believes that Venus is a Russian planet. Um, and apparently he also said that the United States once called Venus a Soviet planet because when uh, the Soviet Union uh, was the dominant political force in that region, uh, that is when the uh, various spacecraft uh, were sent uh, to the planet Venus. And so it's, you know, in many ways it, um, uh, it, it, it was a very much a focus at the time uh, by the Soviet Union. My reading of that is that this is... Um, nothing that we should worry about. Um, I don't think what they're trying to do is declare ownership of Venus, um, partly because that's illegal. Um, and, yeah, I was going to say, you can't, can you? Yeah, you can't. Russia is a signatory, of course, to the International Space Treaty uh, and all its ramifications, and that says nobody can own anything. It, 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 uh, the, the, the latest versions of that, though, say that if you if you bring something back from somewhere, then it's yours, but you can't actually own the place itself. So you can't own Venus. Um, and the other thing is that, um, uh, you know, v Venus was last involved, sorry, Russia was last involved with Venus in 1984, which is quite a long time ago. Uh, so maybe the, you know, maybe the presses have gone cold on that. Um, yeah. So... Uh, I think they're just stirring pot a bit, aren't they? I think that's right, what it is. I don't think it's a particularly serious comment, but it'll be very interesting to see if it does go further. Um, yeah. You know, you could you could say uh, to some extent that Mars is American because there's far more uh, American hardware, NASA hardware on Mars than any other, any other nation. There's a few bits and pieces of other nations' attempts, but um, all the successful right. stuff has been... Maybe, maybe Russia was just getting a bit jealous that they're kind of out of the um, astronomical news these days. It's all China, the United States, India, European Space Agency, yeah. JAXA. They're all getting the headlines. Yeah, that's that's certainly true. Uh, they are the headline things. But it has to be said, Russia is still doing great things in the collaboration with the International Space Station. So, you know, they shouldn't feel out of it. Uh, they're doing no, it. definitely not. And, 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 of course, the private operators are getting a lot of headlines these days too. Uh, one more thing, um, going back to our previous story about Aurori, uh, I read this week, just a totally unrelated thing, uh, there is a new report suggesting that the sinking of the Titanic could have been worsened by 
the Aurora Borealis. They they have now discovered that the Aurora uh, Aurora Borealis was uh, visible that night. It's in the captain's log of the Carpathia, and they think the geomagnetic effect may have may have uh, disturbed the, um, the uh, distress signal. From from Titanic and the, the ships nearby may not have ever heard their signal, even if they could, uh, even if they were listening. So, that's a really interesting little um, discovery that uh, has been put in a in a report this week. Whether or not it holds water, no no pun intended, um, is is uh, is. To, remains to be seen, but it is a pretty solid theory by the sound of it. I um, I saw the headline, Andrew, but um, I've been so busy this week I didn't have time to follow it up. But I'll have a look at that and let you know what I think mm. next week. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to follow that up because it is a fascinating theory. All right, you're listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Now let's take a little break and find out more about our sponsor, Express VPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. Uh, this is the one I use. I've been using it for a couple of years and I love it. When I joined Express VPN, they were, they were brand new, uh, new to the market, but uh, I read a lot of reviews and did a lot of comparisons. And there was just something about their, their business model that I particularly liked. And a couple of years down the track, honestly, can't complain. Their interface is very easy to use. Their, their service is second to none. Uh, I've had to contact them a couple of times about um, certain things that I wanted to do, and they were brilliant. So you may be wondering why I do need a VPN at all. It's all about privacy. Uh, Do you really want big tech companies, governments, and others knowing uh, what's going on with your online activity? Even if you're having nothing to hide, it just feels downright creepy. Uh, I think you'll agree, and governments are getting more and more interested in what you're doing every day. And so, yeah, protecting your privacy is what VPN is all about. And how often do you uh, run across websites that you want to get information from only to find that they're geo-blocked? This is becoming an increasing problem, but ExpressVPN solves that problem for you. Uh, Now, if you go to our special URL, you'll see quite a list of things this service can help you with, things you may never have thought of before. As I say, it's the one I use, secure, fast, and it just works. Uh, So protect yourself online today and find out more about how to get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's T-R-Y-E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Try expressvpn.com slash space to learn more and you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. Now... Back to the show. Roger, you're live. Stay here, also. Space nuts. Now I must uh, send out an apology. We have been guilty of not adding uh, extra material to uh, our our Patreon uh, Patreon platforms lately, and and that's just um, that's that's on me. Time is uh, against us. Fred and I have, um, have been kind of under the gun lately. I don't know why, but that's just uh, the way. The world is sometimes, but uh, very soon we will will um, track down some Patreon type questions and uh, add them to the um, the bonus material that we do offer our patrons. And if you'd like to become a patron, there are uh, quite a few ways of doing it. Uh, you can go to the Supercast website and find us there and sign up for a package deal, or you can go to patreon.com slash space nuts and sign up for whatever amount you deem worthy. I mean, it doesn't have to, it can be as little as $3 a month, I think. That's US. Uh, Or you can go to our platform, Acast, and they have a donation portal. But it's totally voluntary. We never, ever will tell you you have to do it. We will never put a price on Space Nuts for uh, everyone to have to pay. If you so desire, it is up to you, and we certainly appreciate it. And, um, uh, you know, that is fantastic that you want to put some money towards the the podcast, but it is absolutely and utterly voluntary. So uh, thank you again to our patrons, and we'll get some bonus material in there for you as soon as we can. Now, Fred, let's move on to our next story. This is exciting as well. I mean, we talked about Russia claiming Venus and that America should probably lay claim to the to the planet Mars, but uh, no, they're focused on the moon and NASA's just um, published its plans for 2024. 
going back. That's right. This is the Artemis mission. Um, the, uh, the you know the the the, the flagship mission. Uh, of human spaceflight for the next few years. We'll hear a lot about it. This is the equivalent of Apollo, uh, very much so. And in fact, in many ways, it resembles Apollo, but with uh, modern hardware, hardware that uh, uh, really is 21st century rather than uh, mid-20th century. So uh, what's the story? Well, as you said, NASA uh, has announced the schedule for um, putting the next uh, man and the first woman on the moon by 2024. Um, it's uh, Jim Bridenstine is the NASA administrator. He's been the person who's uh, who's set this uh, or been the front man for for setting this all out. Um, as we've solidified more of our exploration plans in recent months, he says, we've continued to refine our budget and architecture. We're going back to the moon for scientific discovery, economic benefits and inspiration for a new generation of explorers. As we build up a sustainable presence, we're also building momentum towards those first human steps on the red planet. So uh, the schedule that's been laid out, I think, is still pretty ambitious, uh, uh, Andrew, um, but involves uh, the Space Launch System, which is the new rocket system that will actually take astronauts to the moon. And you might remember that's a sort of, um, you know, in, in many ways it's... Uh, it, it owes its leg, or owes its origin to the space shuttle, because the, uh, the the booster rockets that we use to launch the space shuttle are also, I think, they're now upgraded, uh, the new improved versions, but they're the same booster rockets that will be used for the space launch system. And then there's a core uh, space vehicle. Uh, which, again, uses engines. I think it, the core stage has four engines. The boosters are solid fuel rockets. The core stage uh, has, I think, hydrogen, oxygen fueled. Uh, uh, I think there are four engines on that core stage. Uh, and they, these are all apparently in uh, the final series of tests at the moment. They're talking about a critical hot fire test this fall. Uh, fall, of course, being springtime here in Australia. Um, but mm -hmm. that... You know, that's exciting stuff. Um, so uh, once that, um, you know, that uh, hot fire test has been done, the core stage will go to the Kennedy Space Flight Center in Florida to be integrated with the rest of the space uh, craft. And there will be two test flights actually going around the moon uh, to check that everything works. The first one, Artemis 1, on track for 2021. That is next year, Andrew. So we'll be seeing uh, a, a, an uncrewed mission to fly around the moon uh, with all the hardware that will actually carry astronauts there, but nobody on board. Uh, that will be next year. And then Artemis 2 will build on that. It'll do the same thing. It'll be a, a, a translunar flight, uh, but with a crew on board. And that is expected two years later. So 2023, uh, we should find an equivalent, a kind of equivalent of Apollo 8, which was the, yes. you know, the uh, just look, that was so emotive when Apollo 8 was successful in uh, December 1968. Um, uh, Christmas Eve, they were going around the moon, astonishing stuff and absolutely riveted the world. So if it's anything like that in 2023, yeah. I think um, that will be great. Um, and then... Uh, Building on that, um, you know, this all then depends on uh, the, uh, the, the the commercial sector coming in because the commercial sector, and I'm sure SpaceX are involved with this, and I think Orbital, although Orbital isn't called Orbital anymore, uh, I think there are other companies um, that are building equipment, might be Northrop Grumman. Sorry, I've got all these companies mixed up in my mind at the moment. But commercial delivery services, and, and they will send basically um, hardware to the moon, landing the moon on, sorry, landing on the moon. And this will start again next year, twice a year. They're talking about landing stuff on the moon in preparation for the 2024 Artemis 3 mission, which will be when humans return to the surface of the moon. Um, you can probably hear there's some magpies cheering us along outside. My yes, door. I can hear them. We've 
uh, we've got a lot of them around Dubbo at the moment. It's not a time of year to be outside with a magpie either. Oh, but they're, they're, they, get, they get a bit vicious this, this time of year. But they are wonderful birds. Anyway, beautiful birds. The, our team is three uh, is destined to land the first astronauts on the lunar South Pole. Uh, so it will be you know, basically uh, a mission that will put them into lunar orbit. And then uh, they will... There's st- still some uncertainty about the exact uh, configuration that will take place for our team is three. Um, I think what the hope is, though, that they will dock with the gateway module, which you and I have spoken about before. This is almost like a mini international space station, which will be in orbit around the moon. And it's a kind of a staging post uh, to gather supplies, to check everything's working all right, uh, and um, getting on board the landing system, whatever that is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, finishing, finishing off the games of Yahtzee before they go down onto the surface. Yes, that's right. All of that, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> all, what all what do they have to that. do? <laughs> so, yeah, it's um, look, it's, it's very, very exciting uh, that in the next four years we should see um, a really remarkable uh, access to the moon. They are talking about seven days on the lunar surface. Uh, really? With, yeah, nice. longer, longer than uh, longer than what we had with any of the Apollo missions, and then uh, back to using using the lander. So the lander does not go with them from Earth. Uh, it's there already because it's been placed there. Unlike the Apollo lunar modules, which flew with the Apollo astronauts <clears throat> um, to get them down to the moon, get them back to the command module, and get them back home, these components are all going to be delivered there robotically. Uh, so there'll be a lander that will take them down to the moon. Uh, they will go back up to probably the gateway module um, to, uh, to you know, have a shower and change and things like that, and then get back to Earth on board the Orion module. The Orion, of course, being the equivalent of the command module in the Apollo era. So remarkable stuff, really remarkable stuff. And somebody out there, Fred, whose name is unknown to us at this stage, is going to become incredibly famous as a consequence of this as the first woman on the moon. Exactly. I think that's going to be extraordinary. Yes, that is an amazing thought. And that person is already wandering around probably um, somewhere in NASA's headquarters or something like that. Great stuff. Yeah, they probably have a group of candidates that they're considering oh, at the moment and um, they're going through a process of selection. Uh, well, they might not have started yet. We've still got a few years up our sleeve, but uh, I think they'd have some ideas at this stage. But, uh, yeah, we, we wish them well. And uh, I think it'll be as exciting for people of today that weren't around for the for the landings on the moon 50 years ago uh, to, to witness this again. And you know, it's just uh, an extraordinary thing to achieve to be able to move, you know, go to another body in the universe, even though it's the closest one to us, and go for a bit of a walk and, you know, even drive a car, which yeah, we've, right. done. <laughs> which, which we've done. And I might point out, you mentioned Apollo 8. Uh, if you go to uh, NASA, Cape Canaveral, they still have mission controls set up for the Apollo 8 mission, and you can, you can actually re-witness the launch process uh, as it happened, you can hear the whole thing while you're looking out over the over the control panels, and everything lights up as as the different That's sequences. Right. Yeah, it's really quite enjoyable to watch. Um, and, and I will also mention a um, a TV series that I'm watching at the moment called For All Mankind. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's an alternative history series where the Russians were first on the moon. <sighs> Okay, that's and interesting. It's really fascinating, really fascinating. <clears throat> uh, the, um, and I won't say much more. I don't want to spoil it for anybody. No, uh, the Russians, of course, were developing their N1 rocket, uh, which was the equivalent of the Saturn V, um, mm. but very different in its architecture and ultimately a failure. Very, very sad. Yes, yes. and that was the difference in the end, I think. Um, but, yeah, it's a good series if you want to look it up. It's called For All Mankind, and I've had people pestering me to watch it. <laughs> so I finally got down to it, and I'm really enjoying it, really enjoying it. Uh, they portray the American disapproval of the um, Russian success very, very well. <laughs> and there's nothing they can do about it. It's brilliant. Um, but they've got other plans, of course. Uh, so, um, yeah. Um, you're listening to Space Nuts, the podcast, episode 221. Andrew Dunkley here with Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. You're listening to the Space Nuts podcast. 
with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. And thank you for joining us. And don't forget to tell your friends about us. Uh, they, if, if they've got their favourite podcast distributed, they'll probably find us because we're on just about everything. Uh, and that includes YouTube. And we, in fact, received a question from somebody on YouTube uh, this week, which we will tackle shortly. But I will remind you that if you do want to ask us questions, you can certainly email them through via our website, bytes.com. Uh, slash space nuts at by b i t e s z uh, dot com, or you can message us via Facebook, uh, or you can um, ask your question uh, yourself through our website, which is uh, space nuts podcast dot com. Click on the AMA link and you can just press the record button if you've got a device with a microphone. Uh, most people know how to use microphones, unlike one particular questioner last week who couldn't figure it out. Oh, I, I did promise I'd never go back there. Anyway, um, it's all in good fun. I'm glad I know how to use a microphone, otherwise my 30-year career in radio would have been very short. But, um, yes, you can ask questions uh, directly of us, uh, and we love hearing your voices. Now, Fred, uh, we do have a question first up from Ralph Haney. This is a bit of a long question, but it's one you wanted to tackle because he wants to know why his telescopes go fuzzy. Here's uh, Ralph Haney. Hello, Professor Watson and the venerable author, Andrew Dunkley. Very amateur astronomer here. Can you please clarify for me a basic astronomical point? While looking through my six and a half inch Cassegrain telescope, I see Jupiter with its multiple moons and wonderful clarity. Every night I see orbital changes, making it all the more interesting. Saturn, too, is so fascinating through a telescope. However, as I attempt to zoom in with higher power lenses, I lose clarity, and even though I see a much larger Jupiter, it's a fuzzy white ball no matter how hard I focus. I remember reading somewhere that this has to do with the amount of actual information that is collected through the telescope versus the amount of power. In other words, the stronger... The strongest optical telescope in the world won't help if it doesn't gather enough light. On top of that, as a Neanderthal amateur... Every little bump to the tripod interferes with the experience, and Earth's speedy rotation doesn't help, let alone a beer or two. Buried in my garage, I have a 14-inch Dobsonian telescope tube begging for a primary mirror. It's the remnants of a famous Coulter Odyssey telescope, colloquially called a light bucket. I've yet to find a mirror for it, but I can't wait, and I first need to be able to afford it. Do you have any laying around? Question. Once I do install a large mirror in that tube, am I going to encounter the same type of clarity issues, or will I see more detail with much more information gathered? Thank you both so much for the show. I'm a dedicated listener, fellow nut, and sponsor, Ralph Haney, Northern California. P.S. Don't ever change your intro and outro clips. They're absolutely awesome. Listener says it feels good. (laughs) Oh, Ralph, thank you so much. You know, actually, someone the other day said, can you change your intro? I find it too fast. Uh, I, I'm very reluctant to do so. I, I love our intro um, and I, I I don't want to change it. So I will fight hard for you, Ralph. Uh, loved the musical accompaniment in the background. Is that one of the kids uh, doing piano lessons? It sounded like that. Um, now, um, Fred, Ralph wants to know why is telescopes showing fuzzy images? Uh, Two reasons. There are two things going on here, Andrew, uh, which um, are both in their own way interesting. Uh, Probably what uh, what Ralph is is having to cope with is essentially what the atmosphere does to light, uh, and that is that the atmosphere is uh, effectively a lens in a sense. It changes the... Um, you know, it changes the, uh, the, the the path of light beams through it or light rays through it uh, and turns the image of a star, for example, from the perfect point, which it should be in your telescope, into a blob, uh, which is bigger or smaller depending on how much, uh, how much turbulence there is in the atmosphere. Uh, it's also that depends on how much of the atmosphere you're looking through. When you're looking at something very high in the sky at the zenith, then you are looking 
basically through a, th- a thinner layer of atmosphere than you are if you're looking down near the horizon where you're looking through a much thicker layer and so the conditions are much worse. So that turbulence is one of the causes. We call it seeing uh, and you measure it by the diameter of a star image which should be um, effectively a point source but we usually say the seeing is two arc seconds or one arc second or sometimes in bad situations five arc seconds an arc second of course being one three thousand six hundredth of a degree that's the diameter the apparent diameter of the image so um yeah bad seeing blows things up uh, and essentially if you're looking at something like jupiter or saturn it just smudges out all the detail um so that's one cause uh and another is related to the physics of the telescope itself, and that is that if you use a magnification that's uh, and there's a there's a number here that comes from theoretical considerations, but it, if you use a magnification which is more than the number of millimeters in the radius of your mirror or lens, okay, that's uh, so if you've got a six inch lens uh, or mirror, as in Ralph's case, he's got a six, six and a half inch Cassegrain telescope. Uh, that's about 150 millimeters. The radius of that in millimeters is 75. If you use a power more than 75 times, you're magnifying uh, the image more than the telescope will deliver detail, if I can put it that way. Um, It's what's called the resolution of the telescope, the resolving power of the telescope, the amount of detail that it can see. And there's a limit to that. Um, And if you use more than, uh, you know, the uh, number of millimetres in the radius of your mirror or lens, that will basically mean you're just magnifying the light. You're not not seeing any more detail. Um, That's a subtlety that is probably uh, it's really the, 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 the lower of the two effects. The atmosphere is the worst part of it. Uh, there is another, let me just add in a third thing. Um, with I find this with my small telescopes that, yes, if you, if you magnify Jupiter up, you just see a blob. And I, and I find it very hard to see uh, structure, the cloud belts in Jupiter. Sometimes you can just about make them out. I use very small telescopes when I'm playing around, so that's partly why. Um, but um, uh, often you've got, in some ways, you've got too much light. You, you, Jupiter's a bright object, and your eye is, you know, is missing the subtleties because there's so much light there. Uh, so sometimes it might help to use a filter. Um, that might show a bit more of the detail. But I think what the, the problem Ralph's having is actually with the uh, the, the brightness of uh, of uh, sorry the, uh, the the turbulence in the atmosphere rather than the brightness of the image. Okay, there you go, Ralph. Um, just get up there and calm the atmosphere down. Throw a blanket over or something. <laughs> if we could do it. that, it would be wonderful. So, Andrew, mm. uh, or, or, or just get out of the atmosphere. That that would be a way. That's what the, exactly. That's that's what the Hubble does. Um, just while you're. Um, while we're to, while we're pausing between our two questions, um, I've had an email from the person who couldn't do the audio question because it turns oh. out it's somebody I know. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and so what he says is, I'll read out the email. Uh, Thanks to Fred for answering my anonymous question on space nuts regarding parsecs versus light years. Perhaps not so many thanks to Andrew Dunkley for broadcasting my comment that I couldn't make the recording of my question work. (laughs) So He honestly didn't say not to. (laughs) And I've always had the philosophy in radio and it uh, it, it sort of transfers to the podcast. Uh, Everything is... um, on the table when it comes to what I say. <laughs> Everything. Uh, no. Tell me not to. I'm kidding. No. Yeah. I don't think he bears I've a always... grudge. Um, uh, this person I, I not. Is, is not the kind of person to bear a grudge. But just, just to let you know, your comment did not go unnoticed. <laughs> Well, I hope not. Um, no, but I've, I've always operated in, in radio with the philosophy that um, everything is um, – Open slather if it's if it's uh, yeah, if, it's if it's it's heavy, I, I will use it and yeah. over the years it's um, it's served me well. That's how we get away with as much as we do. I think <laughs> sometimes get away with it. Yes. 
Okay. Uh, thanks, Ralph. Let's move on to our next question from Barlow in Colorado. Hey, so this is Barlow from Colorado. I am curious, and I recognize that this question is dripping with the gooey goodness of theoretical analysis, but if potentially the universe started from a single point, does that mean the form of a black hole in some way? And if so, does that mean that matter can form from a black hole? Is it based on mass? Just kind of generally thinking about that. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, Barlow asks an interesting point. Uh, the origin of the universe is uh, always the subject of much speculation and debate. And uh, I'm, I'm guessing the short form of the question is, did it start out as a black hole and did matter emanate from this black hole to create the universe? Uh, we know there was a big bang. Um, you know, where, where, does, uh, where does Barlow's question sit in the scheme of things? It's a good question because... Um the you know the model of the universe that we use which is based on general relativity when you track backwards in time you come back to a point where the universe was a singularity it was a dimensionless point uh which somehow released the energy that of caused everything that we see around us <clears throat> and a black hole is a dimensionless point the two are effectively the same thing but um a black hole is you know, gobbling stuff up, anything that happens to come near it because of the gravitational potential, whereas the universe went the other way. So there's clearly some difference here. Um, it, the, the two are not the same thing. Uh, although, <clears throat> the, excuse me, there are people who model, uh, modeling the universe as a whole, they talk about the event horizon of the universe. That's a, a, a term that comes directly from a black hole. It's the point beyond which light cannot travel. I have looked into those theories very closely. I think they're fairly speculative. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me again. Um, it, it also has um, links or perhaps connections with um, the theories that some other physicists, and I'm thinking here of Roger Penrose, whose work we've mentioned several times on Space Nuts, uh, a mathematician who has, uh, you know, is a very well-known and very eminent physicist, but he's got a model of the universe, which is that, yes, the universe comes from a black hole that becomes unstable. Uh, so it is a singularity. It expands and all the, 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 you know, the energy turns into matter and we get a universe, which itself spawns black holes. And we know that happens because we can see them. We see black holes of many billions of times the mass of the sun at the centers of galaxies. Uh, Penrose's theory is that these eventually grow so big that they become unstable and then they form another big bang and you get another universe uh, being spawned from that. Uh, I, I'm not sure that, I, you know, it's 10 years or so since I last looked into Penrose's work. I'm not sure <clears throat> how, um, how widely accepted that is today but uh, it might be something I'm, I might go and follow up. Uh, so thanks to Barlow for, for raising the question, because it, it is exactly along the lines uh, that people think about. Mm. Yeah, I suppose with the creation of the universe, you can, can never say no to everything. Um, the, 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 there was no one around to observe it. Uh, we know it happened. We can see the uh, cosmic background radiation evidence. Yep. Uh, but, yeah, what exactly happened is still kind of subject to theory and speculation, I suppose. Um, yeah, although, you know, the, the, pro the problem is that when you get close enough to the Big Bang to be really probing what's happening, physics breaks down because uh, mm. you've got, you know, all these the high energies and things of that sort. But um, we can go a long way towards it. And, and, of course, the future of this kind of study, Andrew, has some... Uh, promise because we eventually will be able to use gravitational waves to probe further back um, into that region which we can't see beyond because of the the cosmic micro, uh, microwave background radiation. Um, oh, that'd be, that'd be awesome to be yeah. able to <laughs> yeah. look further out. Yeah. Indeed. So, all right, Barlow, thanks for your question. 
Now, uh, one more question. This comes from a YouTube listener, Fred Liam Cocroft. Uh, he said, I wish to ask my most learned astronomer at large a question. I'm very confused. Best thing I ever learned about sky watching is following the zenith and look hard for things that don't flicker as much as stars because the solar uh, system is a disk. Yet in Cosmos, this is a TV series uh, hosted by Dr. Neil de deGrasse Tyson, episodes, uh, season one, episode eight shows the moon very close to the south celestial pole over the harbour bridge uh, and that's the sydney harbour bridge and the moon doesn't flicker like a star this can't be wrong i'm sure as he spoke at length about how he feels about incorrect star fields in his book in 2007 gee liam you've been doing your research uh, maybe an easter egg and he owes me a telescope so i can keep an eye on the south pole and make sure the moon is not seen there again yeah sure he's a fancy tv show i bet your chooks are better than his though <laughs> Uh, the, I mean, it's more of a remark than it is a question, but he brings up an interesting point about the uh, position of the moon. Uh, well, that's right. And it's, um, it, yes, yeah, so you can never get the moon near the, the celestial pole. That's the point. And the celestial pole, of course, in the south, um, we've got the Southern Cross pointing towards it and the, the pointers, we all, many of us know how to find the south celestial pole. From there, it's, it's within that region of the sky. The moon never goes there. Uh, because the moon is in orbit around the Earth and sits in an orbital plane that's similar to the the, the plane of the Earth's orbit, so um, often you do get hiccups where illustrations are made that show something that is physically impossible. Uh, and um, uh, one of my um, hobby horses is when people get the moon the wrong way round. Um, so an illustrator might. <laughs> Once didn't we? We wasn't there some major snafu years ago involving that very issue? The moon was the wrong way round, and for most people they wouldn't notice. But um, yeah. yeah, somebody did. Yeah, so you, that's right. So if you put a graphic of the moon in the, you know, as it's uh, in a in a scene that's supposed to be the southern hemisphere, and it's it's showing the moon the way up it is in the north, then then you know something's gone wrong there. Um, and actually, the the crescent moon is another one. Um, in the evening sky here in the south, uh, the crescent moon, it's the left-hand portion that's lit up. But in the northern hemisphere in the evening sky, it's the right-hand portion that's lit up. Uh, and sometimes people get that wrong as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I can understand the frustration. I, I'm the type of person that sits and watches TV shows and films looking for continuity errors. Well, there you go, <laughs> that sort of thing. That's right. I can't help myself. And I'll say to Judy, oh, did you see that? The, the shoes change colour. No. <laughs> oh, I'm going to show you. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> I do. I rewind it say, look, look. Oh, yeah. It doesn't. <laughs> I expect a better reaction. Well, but, tell, um, tell Judy she has my sympathies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, but but yeah, she, he's brought up a good point. They they put the moon in the wrong place, and he noticed. And then um, uh, Neil's obviously counted that in a uh, in a book of his. But you know, there's a thing in the industry called creative license, and I dare say that that's what's happened here. Maybe so, maybe so. <laughs> Yeah. All right. I appreciate the uh, the feedback, though, Liam. Lo lovely to hear from you, a YouTube listener. Don't forget, you can listen on YouTube too, if you so desire. Um, we we want to get our download numbers increasing on YouTube, so that's uh, that's fantastic. Uh, and that wraps it up for another week. Fred, thank you so much. It's a pleasure, Andrew. Always good to talk to you, and always good to find out what's going on in the universe, and also hear what our listeners are thinking. It's uh, great mm -hmm. to have all the feedback. Uh, lovely yeah, to love it. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and uh, yeah, keep those cards and letters rolling in, if indeed you want to do it that way. We, we um, <laughs> whatever you want to. There, do. there might be an address. I don't know what our address is. Uh, I know yeah. our email address. Space nuts uh, the earth, isn't it? Isn't that what it is? Space nuts earth. Yeah, that'll <laughs> do. Yeah, it'll find us. Uh, thanks, Fred. See you soon, yeah. uh, Fred. What's it?
astronomer at large, part of the team here uh, on the Space Nuts podcast. And thank you again for listening. Don't forget to tell all your friends and we'll see you for another episode next week. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.